In this lecture we're going to look at alternative or adjunctive treatments to the normal treatments that we would use in sport therapy. And we're going to cover three manual therapy, shockwave therapy and needling, so dry needling. Let's start off with manual therapy itself. So we need to have a sort of a definition as to what we understand by manual therapy. So this is a, a, a definition by the American, um, American Physical Therapy Association, so APTA. So they say it's a clinical approach utilizing skilled, specific hands-on techniques, including but not limited to manipulation and mobilization, used by physical therapists to diagnose and treat soft tissues and joint structure for the purposes of modulating pain, increasing range of motion, reducing or eliminating soft tissue inflammation, inducing relaxation, improving contractile and non-contractual tissue repair, extensibility, stability, facilitating movement and improving function. So essentially then they're saying that there is some sort of skill involved, so it's not something that you can just do. It's a hands-on approach, so it involves touching the patient in some shape or form. Various different titles, so we've got manipulation, we've got mobilization, all sorts of uh, different things there. But interestingly enough, they're talking about treatment but also diagnosis, so it's part of the assessment that a therapist can use and on the whole, we're looking at increasing movement, so that would be used where there is stiffness, or reducing pain, so modulating pain. So that may be used for, you know, for the sake in itself of saying, well, okay, if we do manual therapy, the patient might have to take fewer painkillers, for example, or for reducing pain to allow another form of treatment to follow. Now, in addition to that, and they're saying, well, you know, how does that occur? Well, it seems to have an effect on inflammation, on relaxation of muscle, and it seems to have an effect both on, you know, muscle and, and, and non uh, non contractile tissue. All right, so that's our definition. Just a little bit of a, a link here to some uh, further resources. If you click on the link at the bottom of the page, that'll take you through to two papers um, with some videos, um, bits and pieces, and follow up on the research. So these are papers that I wrote for um, CoKinetic magazine back in the uh, in 2018. So let's have some uh, a look at some general principles then of this hands-on technique that we've just been describing. So we've got various different ones, all of which sort of fall into similar categories. So we've got massage, soft tissue mobilization, connective tissue techniques, myofascial release, cranial sacral techniques, mobilization, manipulation, mobilization of neural tissue, visceral manipulation or mobilization, strain, counter strain. So these are all titles which essentially imply that when you put your hands on the body and you do something, you may be able to differentiate between the tissues that you're actually affecting. So, and there would be some argument for and against that. So if I put my hands on your knee, I'm clearly affecting the skin. Am I affecting the muscles, the ligaments, the joint? And if I am, can I choose which one of those tissues I'm affecting more or less? All right, so that within physiotherapy then, um, these techniques have titles. And then normally, because they are titled after someone who has pioneered that particular technique. So, you know, you may go away from this lecture and, and suddenly find that you're working with your, your football team and you say, well, you know, I find this particular technique is quite useful and you do it for five years, 10 years or whatever, produce a few papers, write a book, and then it becomes your technique. All right, so we've got Maitland technique, 
named after Jeff Maitland, an Australian physio, James Syriac, so Syriac's technique named after um, James Syriac, who was an orthopedic surgeon, um, Carlton Bourne, named after Freddie Carlton Bourne, who was uh, a Scandinavian chap, mobilization with movements, uh, named after uh, Mulligan, osteopathic and chiropractic techniques, named originally after practitioners but then you know grew into um you know a, a, a practice themselves and movement optimization technique is something that we tend to use in our clinic where we say well we're trying to to enhance or change a movement in in some shape or form so we've got um classical techniques affecting the joints as just described and also techniques affecting the tissues so you know massage itself whether it's classical swedish massage or sport massage you know you know a a technique not necessarily used for pathology it may simply be used for relaxation it may even be pre-event um a technique where you're you're um, trying to um, potentially um, improve the condition of tissue and perhaps make injury less likely. Myofascial release, so trying to increase range of motion, reduce pain, reduce tension um, by affecting fascia in some shape or form. Trigger point release, so being very, very local and using pressure onto a painful area or a nodular area. Muscle energy techniques, using the, uh, the reflexes, uh, particularly stretch reflexes, uh, affecting the, uh, the muscles, um, tendon organ reflexes. Specific soft tissue mobilization, where you're trying to use the biomechanics of the tissue itself and mobilization affecting neural systems rather than muscle systems or ligaments. Let's have a look at a few of the principles then which um, uh, uh, underlie these and you know I think we need to say well originally where do these come from? Well they come from the so-called giants, the gurus of mobilization who wrote the book, so Jeff Maitland, Mulligan etc etc. And what they would do is seek to explain how their techniques work to try to increase understanding of students. Now at that stage there was very little research done. This would simply be clinical reasoning where you get an experienced physio saying well how can that occur? You know I'm doing some technique and hey presto that the patient's knee is less painful and it can move further. How does that occur? So they would use a clinical model to explain that and then use that same clinical model to justify their selection of techniques so to, to, to help the student to learn how to select the technique rather than simply using intuition. Now of course later on more research was done which would often challenge the original belief, not necessarily the effectiveness of the technique but the model of how that uh, effect occurred. So we've got mobilization techniques, so moving joints and normally that's within their normal range of motion but not necessarily increasing beyond that. If you're increasing beyond their normal range of motion then typically that would be a manipulation. Um, the other way of looking at that would be to say how rapidly you do the movement and how much force and on the whole a more rapid more forceful technique tends to be a manipulation and less energy going into the tissues tends to be a mobilization originally named for joints but nowadays also used for soft tissue and those techniques are graded with different approaches so normally in the Maitland system which is more commonly used in, in um, sport therapy physiotherapy for example we talk about grades one to four being a mobilization and a grade five being a manipulation but other grades are used in other techniques so for example Syriac's techniques use, use slightly different uh, grading but on the whole I think we can say well 
you know, did you push gently or did you push forcefully and did you do it slowly or did you do it quickly? Okay, the other way of representing that movement is to, is to use a movement diagram in the same way as if you, you know, play a tune on the guitar, how would you teach that to someone? Well, you would, you would use music. So music would be the notation of the, 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 the sound that's coming from the guitar. So the movement diagram is the notation of what you're doing with your hands. And so we talk about where the resistance in the movement is. So is the resistance um, at the beginning or at the end and does the pain occur at the beginning or at the, the end of the movement. So for example if I bend your knee is there immediate pain and does that pain start to increase and you know does it finish and the, the, the first pain would be the onset of pain and P2 would be the maximum pain, the end if you like and that's the same with the resistance so when does the resistance start and where is that maximum resistance and you know can be can be useful for you know using in notes um, it gets a little bit complex when we talk about movement diagrams and, and they they get a little bit um, a little bit more complex um, and probably unnecessarily so we also have from Kaltenborn we have um, sort of rules of, of mechanics and the principle being that if you have a joint with run round end and the other bone has a hollow end then they will move in different directions um, depending on which you move first so this is nowadays we would call it an order effect but at that time they called it the convex concave rule and again used usefully to guide movements so do 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 the joint surfaces move in the same direction or in opposite directions um, but when we look at these principles through the magnifying glass of research uh, they don't hold water so when we look at whether you can judge the grade of a mobilization so you could be a very very experienced very highly trained highly skilled manipulator and you could compare the grades of, of manipulation that you use to the grades of your friend and they wouldn't be the same and those you know those, that, that type of research has been has been done over and over again secondly what you're feeling with your fingers doesn't necessarily represent what is under the skin so there is no reliability between what you feel or very little reliability between what you feel and things like the concave and convex rules don't work biomechanically now that has been used as a bit of you know a stick to beat manual therapy with saying it's unscientific but we have to remember that often these principles were only used to teach the manual therapy technique it doesn't necessarily mean that the technique doesn't work it simply means that the model of explanation can be challenged so it's a little bit like saying you know we inject this drug into your knee and it has a fantastic effect it totally removes the pain and you can walk normally and we do this dozens of times and it always works or the majority of times it works and later on you find that actually it wasn't the chemical within the drug that you that, that caused the effect it was simply the volume of material that you put into the joint and if you put in the same volume of saline you have the same effect now that doesn't mean that it doesn't work it just means the model we use to explain it wasn't correct all right let's move on a little further so when we look at these more forceful techniques then manipulation techniques they are often rapid and they don't move an awful lot so we talk about high velocity low amplitude movements typically shortened to HVLA movements and these again you know are taught and as a tutor you teach them and you you try to get the the, the student to do what the the, um, the teacher is doing um, to reproduce that manipulation 
and so there's been a, an aim to sort of say well can we all get together so that we're doing more or less or at least teaching more or less the same thing and so these four phases are often used so firstly what position is the patient in and does it make any difference so if you're doing a mobilization on the lumbar spine if i do it with the patient lying on their front does that make a difference than if I do it lying on their side or sitting? So the orientation is the first thing. Um, when you did the mobilization to this patient last week, I want to do the same thing that you did. What was the starting position? Secondly, what did you do before you did the manipulation? Did you take up the tissue slack or did you just whack them on the back from when your hand was an inch away? because whatever you did worked for them and I need to be able to do the same thing. So if you just said you manipulated their lumbar spine and they came in and said, oh, that's fantastic. That, that manipulation that person did last week was really good. Can you do it again? How am I gonna reproduce that? I can't re just reproduce it without knowing what you did. So we need to describe it. And without writing an essay, we, num we need some sort of shorthand. So we've got the patient position. We've got the preload. Did you take up the slack? And if so, what sort of force did you use? Then what did you do when you took that slack up? So did you do a thrust or was it a gentle pulsing? And then finally, what did you do as they came out of that movement? So the resolution. Now that, you know, we're describing for a manipulation, but you could describe that in, in the gym, couldn't you? You could say, well, okay, this, this person did a bench press, right? Well, when you did your bench press, was it a flat bench press or was it an inclined bench press? Oh, I don't know. I didn't write it on the notes. Well, how, do you, how can you reproduce that? Well, I can't. So when you did that bench press, did you do it with an Olympic bar where you were, somebody passed it to you and you loaded? Or did you do it with a machine where you simply whacked your hand against the machine? Oh, I can't remember, I didn't recall it. Well, there's a lot of difference, isn't there, between preloading with an Olympic bar and simply taking the machine from, you know, the, the, the weight of the machine. You know, there's no load to start with and then you suddenly push. And when you did that movement, was it a slow set? So did you do negatives? Did you say, well, okay, push, hold, and slowly lower? Oh, I don't know, I didn't record that on the notes. Well, you know, we can't reproduce it. And at the end of it, did you rest? Yes. How long did you rest for? Well, this person rested for 15 seconds before he did his second set, whereas this person rested for two minutes. Well, there's a lot of difference, isn't there, between those two. And unless it's described, we can't reproduce it. Okay, sometimes people will require cavitation. They, 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 they think it's good. Patients think it's good and sometimes practitioners think, well, if I get a click or I get a pop, then that's good. Actually, the research has shown that it makes no difference whatsoever to the joint, but what it does do sometimes is make the patient think that it has worked. Okay, so if you set them up to believe that, they will think that it's worked. Okay, um, then we, we need some feedback from the patient. So what are they going to feel? And we often use some sort of um, visual analog scale to, 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 uh, to scale that before and after their movement. Okay, so there are dangers to some of these techniques and the dangers come more on delicate tissue. So particularly the cervical spine. And we could go into this, could do a whole lecture on the cervical spine. But essentially we talk about um, cervical artery dysfunction. And within the cervical artery, so the artery is going to the brain, we've got the vertebral artery and we've got the carotid artery. And in some instances, you can have problems. So the carotid artery, because it's arterial, can go into spasm. So if you do something rapidly on the neck, you could restrict the blood flow. And the vertebral artery, if you remember from your anatomy of the cervical spine, goes through the transverse foramen in the transverse process of the, of the cervical vertebrae, the upper cervical vertebrae from C6 upwards. And in some instances, there can be changes in that vertebral foramen through you know, um, biomechanical, 
um, abnormalities or arthritic changes. In some instances, people only have one vertebral artery. So if you did something where you cut the blood flow off, that could be very dangerous. So uh, on the whole, we no longer use, certainly within therapies that are related to the NHS, we no longer use manipulation of the upper cervical spine. We would use mobilization techniques and we may use manipulation of the lower cervical spine or the lumbar spine. But on the whole, it's a question of risk benefit that um, we've got other techniques so I can do a gentle mobilization and the research has shown us that that technique will be as effective as manipulation so why take the risk with that patient so we've got some examples there then 35 neurological cases um, uh, and uh, the greatest risk is the forceful manipulation of the upper cervical spine and rotation movements um, and those neurological cases can vary from strokes to death, I'm afraid. So, you know, this is not something that we would want to, to mess around with. Now, that said, you must also be aware that, you know, you're in a profession where you've got three years university education. There are others around who will do a weekend course in manipulation. And in my, in my years, I have come across some quite appalling examples of um, essentially assault on patients. So I've come across personal trainers where I've seen somebody manipulate the cervical spine or attempting or claiming to manipulate the cervical spine in a gym. I've actually seen that happen. I've seen people where they've been for a massage and within the massage somebody manipulated their cervical spine without permission without consent they went for a massage and somebody simply you know when they were working on the the uh, upper trapezius um, you know took hold of their head and manipulated it so you know this is very dangerous it's also extremely unprofessional um, but you know should not be done but just be aware that if a patient comes to you and they're very very cautious about hands-on techniques just quiz them about their previous experiences because they you know they, they may not have been good so we've been talking about mobilizations and manipulations in joints and in isolation, but of course they can be used as part of movements as well. So you can guide a movement with your hand and you know at which point does a mobilization become massage and does massage become tactile cueing? So you putting your hands on the patient to guide that movement. And, you know, there's a bit of a sort of a fuzzy area there and mobilizations with movement are within that, that fuzzy area. And again, they, they have sort of names. So nags and snags uh, refer to the facet joints in the cervical spine. So also the facet joints are called the apophyseal joints. So, uh, you know, a natural apophyseal glide or a sustained natural apophyseal glide would be where you're helping the movement, guiding the movement on non cervical spines um, or non spines in general they're called mobilization with movement so you can do a mobilization with movement um, of ankles and shoulders etc and essentially this combines a passive movement now originally it was claimed to do all sorts of different things um, to move the joints in a certain way and again the research has shown us that that does not occur but what it does seem to do is to retrain the movement so essentially when you get pain that pain can become linked to a specific movement and if you change that movement subtly sometimes you can decouple the pain from that movement and, and that is what is believed to be occurring in, in these particular techniques so sometimes you can get you know quite spectacular reductions in pain and increasing range of movement with very little force and it seems to be this sort of uncoupling if you like of um, the, um, the link of a pain or muscle spasm to a particular movement Okay, so what we would do with the mobilization with movement then is we would deliberately use a mobilization, so a gliding mobilization across the 
the joint so we would use a, a sort of a lateral glide movement so if somebody's bending or straightening their knee we would be pushing across the joint so within a joint you have two types of movement two classifications of movement movements that the patient can do themselves and those are called physiological movements and movements which the joint is capable of doing but the patient has no control over those and those are called accessory movements so for example if you are testing somebody's anterior cruciate ligament where the patient is lying flat with their knee bent and you move the tibia on the femur you try to slide the movement so you're sort of pushing against the tibia now that's that's a gliding movement that's coming from the front to the back so it's called an antero-posterior glide um, and what you're trying to do with mobilization of the movement is to use to, with your hands to do a physiological uh, sorry to do an accessory movement to do an accessory movement while the patient does a physiological movement so you say to them bend and straighten your knee how does that feel oh, it feels a bit pain it's a, it's a bit painful and, and, and I can't I can't bend it further than that and then you do some mobilizations and that reduces the pain and increases the movement and then you get them to move again and they say well yeah you know it's still a little bit painful and then you would do your mobilization gently while they're doing their movement so it's a sort of um uh, you know, a, a stage in between purely passive, which would be the mobilization or the manipulation, purely active, which would be the patient doing the movement, and you're doing that sort of active assisted stage in between the two. Okay, so we've got a sort of a, a framework here of how we would use manual therapy and on the left we've got the sort of things that we would consider on the right we've expanded a little bit so firstly how quickly do you do it so the rate of the force is it high velocity so very rapid or is it low velocity so slower so you're going to record that on your notes where did you do it within the range of motion was it at the beginning of the range in the middle of the range or at the end of the range or, or does it not matter and if it doesn't matter well it, that's fine record that you know so I would say well okay it was a low velocity movement at mid range okay so you, you did that movement but what was the force so the force what direction was it so I would say well it was a lateral glide because it was coming from the outside of the joint towards the inside of the joint so if I take my elbow and I sort of you know I push from this direction to this direction that would be a medial glide and if I go from this direction to this direction that would be the lateral glide so you know which direction am I going into what was the target tissue was it the joint or was it you know the, the, the tissue so if I I'm treating my elbow and I'm doing something on my elbow because a tennis elbow I'm not affecting the joint I'm trying to affect the extensor carpi radialis longus or brevis muscle so I would say well okay my target tissue there is the tendon now you know whether I achieve anything with that is the subject of debate but that's what I'm aiming for so so on my patient notes you know that I wasn't actually trying to bend and straighten the elbow okay what is the relevant m relative movement so I move my elbow okay well did you move your elbow just by itself or did you move your elbow with your wrist or did you move your elbow with your shoulder so you know what 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 was moving relative to to what and in case of the mobilization if i'm doing a mobilization on my elbow am i moving my radius and ulna but keeping my humerus still or am i keeping my radius and my ulna still and trying to move my humerus okay and then finally on this table but obviously you know the thing you need to think of to start with is what position are you going to do it in and is there a difference so you know I mobilized your shoulder when you were lying flat you've chosen to mobilize the shoulder while you're sitting well there may be a difference on that 
So if you're doing it in sitting, the arm is being pulled down, so there's a certain amount of traction on the, the shoulder joint, whereas in lying, that traction wasn't there. So does that make a difference? But if it doesn't, fair enough. But if it does, you need to know. So you need to, you know, not, you don't need to tabulate it like this, but these are the sorts of things you would not want to record on your notes so that you can repeat it when the patient comes on the next treatment or so that if you refer on, you know, you're ill next Monday and somebody comes in and does your clinic, they can repeat that technique or they can they can progress or change that technique. The patient comes in and they say, well, it was a bit sore. You say, well, okay, I'm not going to do as much force. Well, how much force did the previous person use? And they said, well, you know, I, I used 100% of maximum force. I'm using 50%. And, you know, that, that is not precise, but it gives you a guide. You can make it more precise by by using um, dynamometry and handheld dynamometers and these sort of things. Um, but often they're not in, they're, they're more research based than, and they're not available in university, at least in clinic. Okay, so we're going to have a look now then at a couple of example techniques on the hip. So let's just go on to this first one, play it through and then I'll talk about it afterwards. <laughs> gets hip pathology, sometimes one of the major problems is stiffness and a change in the quality of the movement, so-called movement dysfunction. And we can uh, eliminate some of the pain by using a distraction technique to the hip joint to start with. And then we'll look at two further techniques that we can use to try to use the new movement that we have to um, redress the imbalance which can lead to the movement dysfunction. So the starting position then, patient is supine with the head supported. Okay, so you would record that on your notes. So when the patient comes in saying that their hip pain is worse with prolonged standing or prolonged walking, that normally indicates an inflammatory response through compression. So if we can do the reverse movement, which would be traction, we can often modify those symptoms. And in the time when the pain is lessened, we can then do more manual therapy techniques. So I'm going to be placing traction on the leg, but obviously the leg and the hip joint is a large um, object. So I need to make sure I'm not putting too much stress on my own body. So I could, for example, simply take hold of the model's foot and lean back. But that's going to place stress onto my hands. It's going to be uncomfortable for her. And it's also going to uh, be uh, imparting the force at quite a distance to the target, which is the hip joint. So instead, I'm going to use a, a, a triple grip onto the leg. So I've got the leg high up under my axilla. So the first grip is to use my arm coming round. So I'm gripping into the side. The second grip is the hand and the third grip is coming here. Now I'm not using my fingertips, I'm using the flat surface of my hand. And I can come further in, so I'm getting closer up to the hip, or I can come further back. So I'm in an open pack position, so that's one of flexion and abduction and external rotation. And remember, the open pack position is where the joint structures are more relaxed. I'm coming into a stance position and all I'm doing is leaning backwards. Now inevitably as I do this I will get some lateral tilt of the pelvis but I'm going to impart a small amount of distraction onto that hip joint and what we're looking for is for the patient's symptoms to be modified. So Okay, so the direction there then is a longitudinal direction or an axial glide. So I'm pulling along the leg and I would need in my notes to say open pack position. So I don't need to say flexion, abduction, external rotation. We all know that. But I would say hip mobilization, axial direction and in open pack. And then I need to talk about the force that I'm imparting. So I would say 
um, stance, um, you know, uh, step stance um, and uh, body weight force. We have a dull ache, we try to reduce that. Now I can vary the grip if I want to have less hand grip then I can come into a forelock. So I come into this position and there there's more stress placed on to my forearm um, as it presses into the back of her car. So it can, it can vary the uh, movement itself. And we can also use a traction belt uh, into that movement as well. Okay, so let's have a look at the second one. The... So what I'm going to do is to use a lateral glide movement. So the longitudinal glide movement was the one that we did gripping our leg into this position. So longitudinal glide is simply a traction position but performed as an oscillation rather than a continuous pull. But the lateral glide I'm using uh, is to flex the hip and to move into this position. So. When I'm doing low grade movements, I can use my hand. Now, in terms of um, privacy, that um, patient placed her hand here. I'm locking my shoulder against her upper thigh, and then I'm gripping down towards the groin, and I can slowly lean back, gently oscillating the hip joint itself. If I want to impart more force, I'm going to use my traction belt, and I'm just going to place that around. So we've got a starting position then, so supine um, single uh, crook lying that would be, um, and then the force direction is going to be a lateral glide, um, so using the, the traction belt. And fine, if you could just pull that into, your, into the groin, that's fine, and then that comes round. I adjust the belt so I'm taking up the slack, the belt goes under my hips so that it doesn't slip. I'm supporting the knee, one foot goes back, and this hand is simply monitoring the movement of the hip. And as I lean back, I'm oscillating that position. So I've taken the slack up of the movement, so that was one of our variables, and it's a movement oscillation, and it's uh, a, a fairly low grade, so I'm not using the whole of my body weight, I'm not leaning back as we did in, in the previous video. So that's my lateral glide mobilization, and once I have uh, performed that and I've modified symptoms, if flexion was the painful movement, so drawing the knee towards the ribcage was painful, I can now repeat that movement with the lateral glide and I'm performing a mobilisation with movement. So an MWM to hip flexion. So I'm lifting the foot up, I'm drawing the, the hip into a lateral glide position and then I'm leaning. So the mobilisation with movement then is lateral glide and flexion where flexion of the hip was limited either through pain or through stiffness. Towards my leading foot so that I'm not bending my spine. So we've got a combined movement of lateral glide with my hip flexion. And in some instances you may need the patient in shorts if you want skin contact, um, but if you're doing that then the belt needs to be padded with a towel or you can just use uh, clothing to protect the skin. So that's the lateral glide technique leading into a mobilization with movement combining lateral glide and hip flexion. 
So just finally then a note on these grades um, because they are sort of descriptive. So we've talked about the Maitland grades 1 to 5 with grade 5 being the manipulation and grades 1 to 4 being mobilizations and essentially they vary depending on how much you do, so how much force you put in. So is it a small amplitude or is it a large amplitude? and then where that occurs. So it is, is it a small amplitude movement at the beginning of the movement or is it a small amplitude movement at the end of the movement, uh, vice versa. Okay. And then for Kaltenborn, we have grades one, two and three, which vary on in what they're doing. So grades one and two, you're looking at either tractioning the joint very slightly or separating the joint surfaces and grade three is more as a soft tissue stretch and again you know there is we that's purely descriptive so yeah, that's grades a b or c so mobilization within the pain-free range sustained stretch at the end of the movement or a high velocity low amplitude manipulation so broadly speaking all of these techniques are descriptive so you know when you look at the research of the differences the, between the grades it doesn't really hold water and when you look at whether one practitioner puts more or, or you know whether one person's grade one is the same as somebody else's grade one there is very little correlation so i think what you can say in your notes is you know what sort of force? Was it a low force or was it a high force? Where was the movement within the, the joint? Is it the beginning range, mid range, end range, whatever? Um, and um, how much did you move it? Was it a wiggle or was it, was it something larger? So descriptive trying to, to go back to that previous table that we had where you're you know, trying to reduce the description so that it's understandable. Okay.